the fire of hell, does it consume the sinner and destroy the sinner, or does the sinner burn forever under the judgment of God? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, we often focus on Tuesdays on doctrinal issues, on theological controversies. And what we're going to talk about today, perhaps, is the heaviest subject of all, the subject of hell, the subject of eternal punishment, the subject of the future judgment of sinners, of those who reject God's grace And my guest today, Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of influential books on the subject, and a man who holds firmly to the belief that the fire of God in judgment consumes the sinner, hence destruction as opposed to eternal torment. Michael Brown, thanks so much for joining us today on the line of fire. I flew back in from Philly, got home late last night, was there for the funeral of a 22-year-old young man, tragic death, tragic loss, obviously, for his parents and his siblings. My heart's still heavy. Obviously, these things just don't go away for friends. How much more for the family? So please, if you think of it, pray for grace on the Bernstein family. I know there are many people mourning, hurting right now. Every moment there's a tragedy taking place in the world. But this is someone that we're close to. So if you could pray, we'd appreciate it. Pray for God's grace to flood the Bernstein household. Well, this leads us, of course, to the question of eternal life, the question of what happens when someone dies. Are they with the Lord forever? Is eternal life given to the righteous only? Is life taken away from the wicked in judgment? What exactly did the Scripture say? Here's what we're going to do today. Mr. Edward Fudge is going to be with me at least an hour, and if discussion merits it, a second hour. If you believe the doctrine that has been traditionally taught by the church, and most likely you were raised in in the Lord, that hell is eternal punishing of the wicked, that the wicked will be judged and punished not by destruction, but by ongoing conscious torment. If you believe the scriptures point in that direction, even if you don't believe in a literal, physical hell fire, if you take that as metaphorical or symbolical, that the nature of human sin against a holy and eternal God is such that our souls being immortal means that the punishment we experience is immortal. Whatever your reason for believing this, if you hold to that view, I invite you to call and challenge Mr. Fudge on his view. He and I are not having a debate on this today. I have a series of probing questions I want to ask. Of course, he's been asked these before, but I want to ask a series of questions. But the phone lines are open, 866 Three four truth eight six six three four eight seven eight eight four. If you are in agreement with Mr. Fudge's position and believe this to be the true biblical position, then I have a question for you. Do you have the same burden to reach the lost, the same passion to reach the lost, the same willingness to sacrifice to reach the lost that you had when you believed in eternal torment? that hell was a place of eternal punishing, not a death sentence on the sinner who would then cease to be. I'd love to talk with you. 866-348-7884. We come back. I'm going to get Mr. Fudge on the phone immediately. We'll begin to talk these things through. Has the church, by and large, with exception, but by and large, been wrong on this subject? Is this something that violates the very character of God to speak of eternal punishing? Or, in fact, is it the opposite, that the character of God is only upheld and the nature of human sin only upheld when we understand hell to be a place of eternal punishing? And and what about our desire to rationalize hell away? Maybe this is just another humanistic tendency Back with Edward Fudge, author of The Fire That Consumes. Oh God of burning, cleanse 
single flame Send the fire It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to the Line of Fire broadcast. My guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of books, including Hell, A Final Word, and The Fire That Consumes. If you differ with his view, I would like to raise a question to him, challenge him on this based on Scripture, based on tradition, based on theological implications. By all means, give us a call, 866-34-TRUTH. Mr. Fudge, welcome at last to the line of fire. We've been working on setting things up and uh, had some delays along the way, but so glad to have you on the air with us today. Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I want to mention before we start talking about this, if I may, that I have a review of your book, of, uh, of Jesus, The Real Culture of Jesus, on Amazon.com, and I want to encourage everybody to get it and read it. It's terrific, fantastic. You'll see why when you read the review. And secondly, I want to commend you and express my appreciation for your attitude in the way you deal with guests with whom you disagree. Recently, you had some on from the controversy in Southern California, and you were so full of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, in contrast to the other gentleman's carnal reactions, and I really do appreciate that and commend you for it, sir. Well, well, thank thank you for the for the kind words. I appreciate it. By the way, during the break, we'll, we're going to have to work a little bit on the quality of the phone line. Somehow, our connection is not as perfect as we want it to be. But thank you for the kind words. Now, some of our listeners may have been surprised already to hear from you speaking as a believer in harmony with with my views, with evangelical views. In other words, they would take such exception to their viewpoint that they would wonder, can a true believer hold to these? So uh, describe your own beliefs as an evangelical so folks recognize this is actually an in-house discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I certainly believe in throughout my, all of three of my books on the subject, emphasize that uh, the Bible is our final authority. It's the only source of doctrine that is without question. It must be the standard and the measure for everything else. And uh, it's only when we go to something besides that that we get in trouble on any subject. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only Savior, that salvation is by grace through faith, and that those who will go to hell go there because they've rejected God's grace and presence throughout this life. Uh, as far as denominations and so forth, this is not the view of any one particular group, uh, nor, nor is it a fringe uh, element, but this, this view is held by outstanding scholars of many major denominations, well-known people whose books our listeners uh, probably have in their library, Anglicans like Richard Bauckham, John Wenham, Michael Green, N.T. Wright, Methodists like I. Howard Marshall and Ben Witherington, Baptists like Clark Pinnock, John Stackhouse, uh, Dale Moody, or e. Earl Ellis, and others, Church of Christ men like Homer Haley, uh, Presbyterians like J- John Frankie, and Philip Hughes, and so on and on and on and on. Now, the fact that this is being discussed more readily now, could that just be the tendency towards humanism? Look, look at so many other things that are being discussed. Universalism is being discussed more now. People are reevaluating what the Bible says about the meaning of marriage and maybe homosexual marriage is okay. Isn't this just another step away from the authority of God and the realities of who he is? That is certainly a, a, a theoretical possibility, which we should investigate, and we should be careful that that's not the case. I have investigated it carefully, and I've concluded that it's not the case for at least two major reasons. First of all, those who are leading the way with the view that I'm presenting, uh, without exception, make as their major emphasis to what the teaching of the Word of God is. That's what it's based on. I didn't change my mind based on emotion or sentiment or anything else other than exegesis of Scripture from beginning to end in a study that took almost a year to complete. Secondly, those who are softening the doctrine today of hell are not people who believe in what's called conditional immortality, as I do. We're not softening our view. 
those who are softening it are the traditionalist people who are teaching eternal conscious torment. And I'll give an example of that. Uh, if you compare preaching today by anybody that's out there teaching eternal torment, if you can even find anybody teaching it, uh, there well, they do not even compare in the least with the preaching of people like Wesley, Spurgeon, and Edwards from centuries ago. The people who've changed their teaching are the traditionalists who used to come right out and describe in horrible detail eternal conscious torment forever and ever. These days you don't find any of them saying that, uh, and, and yet they're saying that my folks, folks of my view, are, are, are softening our doctrine. We're not softening it. We're, we're sticking just with what Scripture says. All right, so l- let me ask this, and again, this is not a debate between us now. We're, I'll present my viewpoint, you present your viewpoint, but rather a discussion where I'm asking you questions about yours. When I was a fairly new believer, I began to memorize 20 verses a day. I did that for six months. By the time I was saved, two years, I'd read the Bible cover to cover five times. And if something was completely unscriptural, I would smell that out immediately because I was so immersed in the Word day and night. And one day on the radio, I heard a Seventh-day Adventist teaching about conditional immortality and the view that the punishment of the wicked is to be destroyed, to be cut off. And he went through the verses, and I said, okay, I could see where he's coming from, but I differ because of X, Y, Z, other verses. So for 40 years now, I've understood where your position is coming from. There are other verses, other reasons that caused me to deeply question it. But for the benefit of our listeners who are not familiar with your point of view, which you claim to be the scriptural point of view, why don't you just take two or three minutes to give the summary of what you believe about hell and future punishment? Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. And I apologize if my answer was so strident it sounded like I was debating. I did not intend oh, to no, be no. doing that. No, no. It had nothing to do with tone. I simply want my listeners to know that I'm not debating you on this subject. I'm giving you an opportunity to share your views, and we are raising questions about it. That's all. So don't worry about the stridency. If you get too strident, let it be. Either you're too strident or not, and we'll have to evaluate that. But okay. please take two or three minutes just yes, to sir. present your viewpoint. Thank you very much, sir, and I begin to appreciate your attitude so very much. The main thing that I ask of anybody is that they have an open mind to study the Scriptures. I gave a lecture September two years ago with 800 people present live, and I began by saying, I hope that nobody changes your mind tonight because it takes more than one hour lecture to change our mind on a subject this big. We need to study thoroughly and carefully and, and be sure we're dealing with all of Scripture in the process. What I believe Scripture teaches, Michael, about this subject is that at the end of the end of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Uh, I know there's all kind of different details in eschatology that your listeners may hold and even differ from my views. But at some point, all of us believe that at the end, Jesus will have a judgment of the world and that those who are saved will be put to his right hand and to eternal life in the kingdom of God forever. Those who are on his left hand will be cast into what's called hell or Gehenna or the lake of fire and brimstone, uh, outer darkness. It's described different ways. And there they will never come out again. And I, I agree fully with the traditionist on that. The traditional view says they never come out. I say they never come out. The only difference in my view and the traditional view is what happens when they're there. I believe the Bible teaches that uh, they will not be made alive forever because, as I hope we have time to talk about in more detail later, Scripture, I think, is very clear that only the saved, the redeemed, are given eternal immortality. Uh, the, The wicked are raised mortal, and they suffer the second death. So I don't believe they're there alive forever, uh, in torment forever, but I believe they suffer according to exact divine justice, perfect divine justice. Nobody suffers one iota too much. Nobody suffers one iota too little. But in perfect divine justice, they suffer conscious torment. And when that is over, the process of that suffering concludes in the everlasting destruction. And so where Jesus speaks of eternal punishment, The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1 tells us what that eternal punishment is. It's eternal destruction. And they're gone, and they're gone forever. They're gone entirely. There's no restoration, no resurrection for them, no return, no recovery. 
and that's the end of the wicked. One quick question. We've only got 30 seconds, Edward. What's the longest you think someone might suffer, a proverbial Hitler? Only God knows that for sure. It could be billions of years. As far as my understanding is concerned, I don't have any limitations on that. Ah, all right. So it's not just that people are resurrected and then destroyed. There is conscious suffering. Your big point would be it comes to an end at some point. All right. Perfect. Perfect divine justice. Perfect divine justice, and then it comes to an end. Okay. We come back. I want to ask one or two questions myself. Then I want to open the phones up. It's going to take us the entire two hours to unpack all the issues. We're doing it bit by bit. All right? I think you'll be enriched, and then we'll study the scriptures. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. The punishment, the eternal punishment of which Jesus speaks in Matthew 25 is indeed eternal punishment, but it is it is, it is indeed eternal capital punishment. Yeah. It's the worst punishment of all, which is the destruction of the whole person, body and soul. Learn about folks going. Yeah, that's, that's the question, as I'm speaking with Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of books, including perhaps best known, The Fire That Consumes. He's had forwards written for his books by leading New Testament scholars like F.F. F. Bruce and Richard Bauckham. His view is that there is conscious punishment for the lost, precise, right justice in the sight of God. And then, whether it's after an hour or six months or 10 years or a million years, that punishment comes to an end. That person is utterly destroyed. Edward, before I go to the phones and we begin to interact, and we'll, we'll unpack this little by little, what we'll talk about conditional immortality and that whole question about the nature of the soul and these other things. It, when I see a verse like Second Thessalonians that speaks of eternal destruction or, or John 3 speaking of people perishing or some of the Old Testament language about people being cut off, if I was to take that in terms of a, of a final end, that language would speak to me not of a process, not of a period of time of judgment and then annihilation, but rather the end, period. That's it. Where do you find in Scripture this idea of protracted suffering and then a final end? The protracted suffering is, a, is, is as much as anything a concession to those scriptures which seem to indicate some degrees of suffering. We don't know how the degrees of suffering will be meted out. There are various possibilities. It could involve intensity. It could involve the type of suffering. It could involve the length of the suffering. We don't understand the answers to that. The Bible is not that clear. But most of the time, uh, most people of of all the different views on hell uh, seem to have an intuitive feeling that scripture requires us to say there's some kind of degrees of suffering. And so uh, this is one way of understanding that, to say that they do suffer exact divine justice. I think that Scripture uh, has enough to say along that line, uh, even though it's not really very clear, to, uh, to justify us in saying that. But I want to emphasize, and I'm really glad you brought this question up, because I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying the major punishment is this conscious suffering. That's not the point. The wages of sin is death, uh, the gift of God's eternal life. And it's those who, uh, who perish uh, who do not have eternal life in Christ. And so the, the, real, the real punishment of hell is destruction. It's total destruction. The three words that are used most frequently in the New Testament for the end of the wicked are die, perish, and destroy. The word hell is not found anywhere in the whole Bible outside the Gospels. It's not used, the word Gehenna I'm talking about, uh, mm-hmm. translate hell. That word is not used by anybody in all of Scripture except Jesus Christ. And it's only used by him when he's talking to Jews who are in or around Jerusalem because they knew what the, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom was, which was the background for this uh, apocalyptic name, Gehenna. 
Uh, so the, where we think always in terms of hell, that, that's not even a word that most New Testament Christians would have known anything about if we go by what's said in the New Testament. But the, the way they talked about the end of the wicked are most frequently these three words, die, perish, and destroy. And that's the real thing. Let me just read a, a, about a one-sentence, two-sentence uh, quote from St. Augustine, if I may. He, he did not agree with my position, but I discuss him in detail in my book, The Fire That Consumes. But he has this wonderful quote which says what I would try to say. Where a very serious crime is punished by death, and the execution of the sentence takes only a minute. No laws consider that minute as the measure of the punishment, but rather the fact that this criminal is forever removed from the community of the living. And so it's, it's, the point is not how long it takes for them to die. There's a process of destruction. For some people it may be instantaneous. I just don't know the answer to that part. But what we do know is the wages of sin is death. The soul of sin shall die. Uh, the, the alternatives are a perish and eternal life and so forth. All right. Yeah, a, a few points in candor just responding. Once you talk about the process and you say that it's, it's a concession or it's not explicit in Scripture, I think that raises a number of concerns about how carefully a text is being exegeted. In other words, if we want to say, well, the wages of sin is death, and, and you'll perish, you'll be cut off, you'll be destroyed, God can destroy both body and soul and hell, etc. To mention all of those things, and then to say that there is a process, and we kind of intuit that, or I, I think that raises serious questions that must be considered. Why that process, then? Also, we do know that many times life is not merely existing. We all know the, about the, the godless widow who lives in pleasures dead while she lives and that there are some who are living today who are not really living. So the, can it simply mean living with God is life? Being separated from God is death? Isn't it that simple? These are questions we're going to take up. I know I said I'd get to the phones, but I wanted to let Mr. Fudge finish his points there. And I don't want to rush these calls. Our phone lines are jammed, but I promise you, as soon as we come back, I am going straight to the phones. All right? Fair enough. Other, otherwise, you'll barely be able to get your question out. I'll have to rush your question. I'll have to rush Edward Fudge's answer. The question is, what does Scripture say? And something I will come back to with, with Edward Fudge as we discuss these ideas as brothers in the Lord and nothing we're discussing challenges the fundamentals of the Apostles' Creed, for example. But this is a tremendously important question. And, as others have said, if there's any doctrine that we would want to rationalize away, it is the doctrine of eternal conscious torment. I would much rather that Edward Fudge's position was correct than a position of Jonathan Edwards and sinners in the hands of an angry God was correct. In terms of just my human desires. The question, Edward Fudge would be the first to say it. I second it. What does the Word of God say? So we will get straight to the calls on the other side of the break. And I want to talk about a different kind of fire. Not the fire of hell. Not John MacArthur's strange fire. But my book, Authentic Fire. You can download it right now and start reading it within seconds. Go to Amazon.com. Type in Authentic Fire. I was thrilled to see that it was as high as the number five best-selling ebook in theology, Christian theology, on Amazon, that it's been number one in pneumatology, Christian study of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see through the book, I'm, anything I tear down, I seek to build up something better. So download the ebook if you don't have a Kindle e-reader just get the app for your computer, your tablet, your smartphone to get a print copy of the book. At this point will not arrive in time for Christmas, but that's quite secondary I'd say to get in the book. It's a $25 value, 420 pages, $25 value including postage. Your generous year-end tax deductible gift will send you this book as a thank you. Call now 1-800-278-9978. 1-800 278-9978. It's the Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. 
your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire, 866-34-TRUTH. Joey, let's play clip number nine. This is the text of Jonathan Edwards, not his actual voice, because we didn't have any way to record it in the 1700s, but from perhaps one of the most famous messages preached in the history of America, Sinners in the Hands of an... You don't have number nine? All right. Matt and Joey, you can... Well, no, no, no. We'll, we'll wait on 11. Matt and Joey, you guys can work that out. My guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of books, including The Fire That Consumes, holds to a view of conditional immortality. The soul is not immortal. Only God has eternal life. First Timothy 6, God grants life to his people. Others are destroyed. He will be taking your questions, and I'll be interacting with those who agree with him as well. Let's go right to the phones. Frank in Staten Island. What's your question or your challenge for Mr. Fudge? Uh, Mr. F- Mr. Fudge is an error, uh, Michael. Severely, it's, I find it amazing that he quotes Augustine, who was a Roman Catholic and who was one of the biggest promulgators of purgatory. But let me quote some of the scholars that usurp all of the scholars that Mr. Fudge uh, quoted. I'm going to give you the Church Fathers, what they said on this. Second Clement, nothing will rescue us from eternal punishment. Justin Martyr, but the wicked will be clothed in eternal sensibility. He will commit he he will commit to the eternal fire along with the evil demons. Athenagoras. A mere, we are not a mere incidental work that we should perish and be annihilated. Theopolis said this, we will be detained in everlasting fire. Irenaeus said the penalty will increase for those who do not believe the word of God and despite his coming. It is not merely temporal but eternal. Tertullian said this, uh, we will be clothed with the proper substance for eternity, and we will have the very nature of this fire, divine as it were, a supply of incorruptibility. Uh, Minuscule said, nor is there any either, either a measure nor an end to these torments. That clever fire burns the limbs and restores them. Cyprian of Carthage said, souls along with their bodies will be preserved for suffering in unlimited agonies. Lactanicus said, but indestructibility and abiding fire that it may be able to hold out against these torches. An everlasting fire, the nature of which is different from... All right, Frank, uh, t- t- tell you what, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me just jump in. You've, you've quoted quite a few, and I know you have more to quote, and some of these go back very early. So, uh, Edward... How do you respond to Frank? It's an important point to ask why did so many early church leaders hold to this if it's completely unscriptural? Well, the question is, did they mean the eternal torment view by what they were saying in those words? Some of them did. Others, I think, probably did not. Uh, I could I could quote a long list of people from the Apostolic Fathers as well, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Didache, of the writings of Ignatius, Clement of Rome, and so forth, Polycarp, who say what sounds like what I'm saying. The fact is, I think, and this is the most uh, the most objective and honest way I know to say it, the Church Fathers, for the most part, particularly the Apostolic Fathers, the first generation after the Apostles, they pretty much limit their talk about this subject to scriptural language, which throws us back to the controversy this is going on about scriptural language. What did the New Testament writers mean when they used that language? And whatever it is, that's what the apostolic fathers seem to mean. When you come to Tertullian, you're down another generation later at least, and there we do have for the first time in Athanasius and in, in Tertull- Athanagoras, rather, and Tertullian, the very first time in the church that anybody explicitly says eternal conscious torment and he bases it very explicitly on the doctrine of the immortal soul, which he says he got from Plato, which we know is paid in Greek. All right. All right. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul, and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. Those were the words of Jonathan Edwards in his 1741 message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a message that was right in the heart of the Great Awakening. My guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of books on the subject of hell and eternal punishment, perhaps most notably, The Fire That Consumes. To me, this is an important biblical discussion that should be had because there are verses that must be studied carefully on this. This is not a fringe issue by any means, nor is this based on a fringe interpretation of a verse or two. It must be looked at carefully. 866-34-TRUTH. Edward, a question for you before we go back to the phones. This is the ultimate question in terms of the destiny of a lost person. I have agonized at times over the thought of hell. I have, uh, I remember as a fairly new believer, was completely devastated by the thought of the possibility of it, almost to the point of being paralyzed by it. You are saying there is an end to the punishment. You don't know how long it is, but the the suffering will be in proportion to the wickedness of the person, the degree of their sin, and then the ultimate penalty for sin, destruction. What if you're wrong on this? What if some of what you teach takes the urgency away from people to share the gospel? Uh, does that weigh on you, sir? Yes, sir. Let me let me add this comment, if I may, quickly. You uh, ended the session a while ago by asking for scripture that mentions something that sounds like degrees of punishment. And I'll just mention Luke twelve forty eight that speaks of many stripes and few stripes in Matthew ten and eleven, which has two or three examples of Jesus saying it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for certain ones than for others. Those are where the people get the idea in part at least for uh, degrees of punishment. I want to emphasize again, however, that I'm saying the real punishment of the of the wicked is eternal death. It's it's destruction, it's perishing. But- But wouldn't that be, uh, apologies for interrupting, and of course I agree in degrees of punishment, we all have to, those that believe in eternal suffering must believe that there are degrees of it, but wouldn't destruction be a relief for someone who is being punished? You're saying that perhaps a, a, a gross sinner who knew the truth and sinned against light in a vile, destructive way is going to pay, you said it could be billions of years, but even if it was a year or a thousand years of serious judgment, wouldn't that destruction be relief? Wouldn't that be the thing they long for? Stop it, end it. What you're saying is the final punishment actually seems to be the way of relief and escape. That, that's the way sometimes we might look at it. I would say, on the other hand, however, that in our own criminal system, I'm, I've been a pricing attorney for the last 20 years and, and more, and, uh, and, and as we all know, even those who are not attorneys, that in our criminal system, in many states, at least in the United States, we have many kinds of punishment for those who violate criminal uh, laws. Uh, there can be a fine. There can be a, a jail. There can be imprisonment. Each of these is considered worse than the other. And in the most extreme cases, for the most heinous crimes, many states have the death penalty. That's considered the most horrible penalty possible even though it only lasts for a minute or two in the process of dying, because it, re- it takes the person away, as Augustine said that I read earlier, from the fellowship of the living forever. And I think, I think when, we, when we go down that road, we're, for, we're forgetting that the greatest, perhaps the greatest punishment of this whole thing is missing out on eternal life with God. Right. That we agree on, for, for sure, that, that we're separated from the life of God, 
that were separated from being with him and enjoying him and serving him forever. I, I would make the distinction, though, sir, that when we're talking about someone in jail fighting the death sentence, that's different than someone who is suffering some endless or or ongoing sense of intense punishment and pain and agony, and and then the destruction comes as relief. But we'll we'll pursue this again. We're we're just doing this in bits and pieces as opposed to formal debate where Mr. Fudge presents one side, I present another side, then we go back and forth. Let me go to the phones. Chris in Bellevue, Washington, thanks for calling the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Uh, hi, Edward. This is Chris. Yeah, by, by the way, because of phone problems we're having, he can hear every word you're saying, but I can't have the two of you on at the same time <laughs> lest we have a crisis. So he says... Hello, Chris. Okay. Yeah, Edward and I are friends. Uh, I was calling in to answer your question about uh, that you posed to conditionalists like myself yes. regarding. Yeah. Before I do, though, I just want to emphasize one thing. You said early on. You asked the question early on. Is the drive to uh, conditionalism based on an emotional reaction to uh, the tra- traditional view? And I just wanted to chime in as one conditionalist for whom an emotion, emotions and philosophy and things like that never entered in the equation at all. Um, my commitment to the authority and inerrancy of Scripture is what forced me um, fighting and, <laughs> you know, uh, fighting and kicking uh, to accept conditionalism. I didn't mm-hmm. want to. So I just wanted to say that. As for your question, uh, did my urgency uh, for evangelizing the lost get reduced uh, when I converted to conditionalism? Absolutely not. It didn't at all. And in fact, one of the interesting um, benefits to this view, I think, is that I'm much more confident in evangelizing the lost, because uh, one of the common reasons that atheists will offer for rejecting Christianity is the view of eternal torment. And now, as a conditionalist, I have the ability to go into discussions with ardent atheists capable of answering that question in a way that resonates, or at least I think resonates much better than the traditional view when it comes to that uh, objection. So, so, not so only couldn't that right? C- couldn't that then be the very argument against your position that if it is somehow more acceptable to an atheist, that God now becomes more acceptable to them, that we've brought God down to their level? No, I don't think so. The scriptures encourage uh, people to embrace God because He is just, not in spite of what one perceives to be His injustice. In other words, I, I'm not uh, conditionalists aren't offering to atheists a more palatable God. We're offering to atheists a just God, one that they can see the justice, uh, one one whose justice is evident from the script, from the doctrines that we're presenting to the atheist. Uh, we're and, not bringing him down to their level. And, and do you agree that a Hitler, again to use the proverbial ultimate wicked person, could potentially suffer for millions of years before ultimately being destroyed? Well, I want to emphasize that the answer I'm about to give you is not necessarily indicative of all conditionalists. Uh, I'm just asking you, Chris. I know, I know. Uh, No, I don't think so, and the reason is because I think that immortality is something that is only given to the saved. I don't think that a life of billions of years is possible if someone does not have immortality. That having been said, there is a a difference in the uh, amount of suffering, the degree of suffering, between, say, the electric chair versus lethal injection. And so I am quite open to the possibility that Hitler will suffer more violently, more painfully than another so person. It's, so it's all the nature of the... But it's all going to end basically quickly because that person's been I, resurrected to be destroyed. I, I think it will end quickly because Sodom and Gomorrah, who are, who are given in Scripture as an example of what awaits the lost, were, were destroyed quickly. But I, but I also think that degrees of punishment are, are, are accounted for by other means. For example, the degree in which they are remembered forever in shame. Someone will be remembered as much more shameful hey, than I, I don't. If I'm gone... What do I care about how people remember? All right, t- t- tell you what, let me get back to, to uh, Edward here. What's, what's your response to Chris on that, that if there is ongoing suffering as opposed to just the intensity of the destruction, then that has to grant that person some level of immortality? Well, I, I understand. There, there are different views on these details held by people in the same viewpoint generally on all sides, so I just happen to see that little point a little different from Chris. I, I believe that God can keep people alive till he's through doing what he needs to do without giving them immortality, which means 
deathlessness forever. Uh, so I don't see that as a problem. But I, I would like to add this to what Chris said and agree with him on this point in the beginning, that, uh, that in Acts 17, when the Apostle Paul is at, at Athens, Greece, he says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, or as decay or the chaos, and this means justice as well. And then that God will be a just judge. Paul tells these pagan Athenians that God will be a just judge, and he expects that they will have some sense of what that means. And so it's, it's not a bad thing to say that God will be perfectly just. And right. Thank you. All right, so, so then, of course, and thanks for the call, Chris. That raises the question, does an unsafe person accept the idea that salvation is only through Jesus? I mean, don't they question God's judges, justice across the board? God of light, hear our cry, send the fire. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. My guest on today's broadcast as we talk about the nature of hell and future punishment, Mr. Edward Fudge, author of a number of books, including The Fire That Consumes. Edward, you are regularly asked, as I would immediately ask if I was having this discussion, what about Luke 16 and the rich man and Lazarus? And you would say it's a parable to teach us about the urgency of helping the poor and so on. My question is this. We do know that there were Jewish groups that believed in all types of torment for the lost after death. We, we do know that there were, uh, there were contemporary beliefs that would be in harmony with the idea of ongoing punishment for the soul after death. There were very Jewish beliefs. But Jesus, in teaching this, doesn't he open up the door for what in your mind would be a gross interpretation misinterpretation that people die and go to hell or die and go to a place of torment, even, even if it was a parable and the only one that would mention someone by name here, Lazarus, does, isn't Jesus then misleading multitudes and generations of people like me and many others who read the word and thought, well, that's simply what it says? No, I think not, because I believe the reason uh, you and I and many others thought that is that that's what we'd always been taught. So we read it with glasses tinted in that direction already. For those who were present when Jesus gave the parable, or for us when we read it, if we can put ourselves in a fresh place to hear it, the the context in in which he tells it, I think, makes it very clear what the real subject and point of this story is. Jesus is teaching on covetousness and stewardship. The Pharisees who are covetous mock Jesus. The Greek word mock there literally means turn up their nose at him. Jesus warns them that the times are critical in which they're living, that now is the time to hear and do the Word of God, because the time will come when they'll learn that God's view of them is not the same as men's view of them. And then he tells a story which illustrates every one of those points. And and so I, I would say that even though it's a parable, even though it's on a different subject, even though it's not what Jesus is intending to talk about, even if, uh, if none of that were true, Still, it's, it still would not teach anything about final punishment necessarily. Right, but it, it would it would teach about the conscious existence of a person after death, even outside of a resurrected body, and it, and it would talk about a separation, and it would talk about a punishment that was that was on ongoing. So and, even if and it I will didn't, say this that, that in the fire that consumes, and in my other books as well, I try to be very careful and avoid. Uh, getting into that subject with any sort of dogmatism. People who hold to the view I do are of different opinions on that subject. Uh, And so I'm saying that that even if the story Rich Man and Lazarus is intended to teach us about the afterlife, which I think it's not, but even if it were, it doesn't talk about final punishment in hell. It talks about some kind of intermediate state because the rich man's brothers are still living on earth. The rich man's brothers still have Moses and the prophets as their greatest authority. And Jesus, the punchline at the very end is, if they wouldn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they would not listen if one rose from the dead, which, of course, he will soon do. And sure enough, they don't listen to him either. Right. So, I mean, we we understand those other larger applications because there were Jewish beliefs at that time that were in harmony with that. In other words, there's no parable where Jesus talks about 
something that is untrue in the midst of it. He talks about leaven that's put in, in different loaves and it rises. He talks about a mustard seed, how small it is and how gross. So these represent other things, but nothing is based on untruths. This would be one based on untrue concepts of the day that he's then drawing application from, which is very concerning. I, I think that Jesus is using a parable that was used among the rabbis. There are seven different versions of this that have been found in rabbinical material, which, of course, you know a great deal about. And, and uh, so I, I just don't see that Jesus is necessarily endorsing what he's not really intending to teach. But let me say this, even if he were, even if, it, even if it's taken to be literal, factual, uh, intended uh, teaching on the subject that is being described as, I believe, mere furniture, even if that were the case, it still is only saying something about an intermediate state before Jesus has risen from the dead for Jewish brothers who have gone somewhere and uh, who might go somewhere and the one brother is already there. So I'm just saying, even if you take it the most extreme way possible, it doesn't really say anything necessarily about the final state of those who are lost. But I, I guess at this point, for those listening, obviously eternity is eternity, and the thought of eternal conscious suffering is dreadful. If I'm rightly understanding C.S. Lewis, he posited something where the degeneration of the human being over a period of time would render their consciousness uh, to, to be radically less than what it is now, even though they would continue to exist. So let's look at that as yet another potential view. But if you are saying that you're not being dogmatic on an intermediate state, and, and we're going to take this up in the next hour, so I, I'm just going to end this. And for now, our phone lines are jammed. And as, as soon as we come back, I'm going straight to the phone. So for Chad, Matthew, Brian, Jay, Sheila, thank you for holding. I'm going to go straight to the phones. We come back, introduce this quickly, and go straight to the phones. So please do stay with us. I'm just doing my best to allow for substantive interaction here rather than soundbite interaction. But what, what I'm wondering about, though, and this is not all conditionalists, all annihilationists. This is Mr. Edward Fudge. If there is the possibility of an intermediate state, so someone could die and be in a state of torment after death, and that could potentially go on for centuries or millennia, then upon resurrection, potentially suffer all types of pangs commensurate with their guilt that could go on for years or thousands of years or millions of years at the end of which will be destruction, I don't see that as so, so different than the idea of ongoing eternal punishment. In other words, it's, it's still something that people are going to question and wonder how could that be right and still underscores the horrific evil of sin and the absolute terrible nature of judgment, which, of course, Mr. Fudge would emphasize. If you're listening to this and you say, oh, my show ends now, I don't get to the next hour, just go to my website later today, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and click on latest audio. You'll be able to listen. And Matt, we'll probably put this up on YouTube as well as an audio for folks to listen to. So you'll be able to go through everything subsequently. If you've been holding, hey, hang on a few more minutes. I really do want to get to you. If you have not yet downloaded my Authentic Fire book, I really encourage you to. I, I got to tell you, I have literally been humbled reading responses of some readers that have been posted on Facebook. They haven't been posted as reviews yet. People couldn't put the book down. They're, they're being blown away by the content, which blows me away. If you haven't gotten it yet, Authentic Fire, my response to John MacArthur's Strange Fire, and so much more, download it on Amazon now or call us for a print version. Your generous year-end gift, I want to send you a copy of the book. Your gift's, of course, tax-deductible. one 800 278-9978 We just ask you to be as generous as you can 1-800-278-9978 My bottom line today Whatever the precise nature Of the final judgment to come It is dreadful It is irreversible And it is of eternal consequence The fire of hell Does it consume the sinner And destroy the sinner Or does the sinner burn forever Under the judgment of God 
It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. God sending people to a hell and keeping them alive forever in it and tormenting them forever. That's out of keeping with the character of God. It's a slander against God. It's not what the Bible teaches. Where the bad folks go when they die. All right, that's, that's our question for today. That was the voice of Mr. Edward Fudge, a foremost respected proponent of the idea that the fire of judgment ultimately consumes the sinner, that they perish, they are destroyed, they are cut off. They will not have eternal life. They do not suffer eternally. Their eternal punishment is to be cut off. 866-34-TRUTH, the number to call. If you differ with Mr. Fudge's view, or if you agree and you want to weigh in, or if you have a, a related question, but we're being very focused in our interaction, we've just discussed this for one hour. We're discussing it for one more hour. 866 348 So, Edward, I want to get to an immediate question I have, and then we're going to go straight to the phones. And thanks so much for joining us these two hours today. I I do appreciate it. We we agree on the agonizing importance of this subject. And personally, I would much rather stand before God one day and see that there were people that I really thought weren't getting in and, and find them there than to have everyone I was expecting to be getting in, not getting in. I mean, we, we, we know that mercy triumphs over judgment and so on. Your view, though, of the, and by the way, I'm not advocating any type of universalism or universal reconciliation. I'm just saying, humanly speaking, I, I'm not gloating over the idea of eternal punishing. And I, I don't agree with Jonathan Edwards in terms of the eternal punishing of the wicked somehow as something positive for the righteous forever to look at or gaze upon. But why talk about smoke going up forever and ever, the worm never dying, eternal reproach, if the punishment does have an end point? Okay, let me take, take those three uh, pictures, one, one by one, if I may quickly. Please. Said the first smoke going up forever. Short of that full expression is another expression uh, used in both Old and New Testament. The smoke that ascends or smoke that goes up. That picture in the language comes from Genesis 19, in which uh, we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, in the morning after the destruction of Sodom, Abraham, it says, goes out and looks down on the plains where the cities had been. And all he sees is smoke rising. It's like we would say a mushroom-shaped cloud. It's not a picture of people suffering. It's not a picture of great agony being experienced when Abraham is watching it. It's a picture of a total destruction. There's nothing left. And, and that's the picture that, that the expression smoke ascending is, is, is a picture of. When you add the, the idea of smoke ascending forever, that comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah 34, the destruction of Edom. And when he adds the word forever, he's, he's simply saying that this destruction is irreversible. Edom will never be rebuilt. And so the smoke ascending and the destruction of the city forever, the destruction of of Edom forever, smoke ascending forever, that's described as, is also found in the book of Revelation, with a great city that's destroyed, and the smoke ascends forever. And so that's that's where that comes from. Sodom and Gomorrah uh, also give us the expression of brimstone and fire, or fire and burning sulfur. And, And that's a picture, again, of a total devastation. Everywhere in Scripture after this event, when you find fire and brimstone, you find a total destruction that's ir- that is irreversible. It's a wipeout. There's nothing, not even grass left on the ground. I tell you what, got, got to jump in. There's still the issue of, of the worm not dying. Doesn't that speak of ongoing decay? And then um, Matthew, Chad, Sheila, Brian, Jay, I know you've been holding. Right to the phones we come back. Oh 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, when it, it comes to the subject of hell and future punishment, I'm quite happy to quote Scripture and warn with Scripture and let Scripture speak for itself. The last thing I'm trying to do is paint a picture of Dante's Inferno. And again, to repeat what I said at the end of the first hour, I believe, and I believe my guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, would agree that the future punishment of the lost is dreadful, it is irreversible, and it is of eternal consequence. Let's go to Matthew in Falls Church, Virginia. What's your question or comment for Mr. Fudge? And thanks so much for holding. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, my, my, my question is, you know, in, in the Torah, God says that we're to use equal scales, the measures on our scales, okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. So if Satan is in rebellion, and his judgment is in, in Revelation 20, right? It says, forever and ever. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what it says in verse 10. Okay? So why would he use a different measure? And then he would be like the what the Greeks and those knew with judges, that they were not righteous judges, that they were looking at people of influence and doing a different... Um, judgment for them, or if somebody had money, you know, they had different measures and different scales that they weighed people on. But here, it's clear that Satan and them will suffer day and night forever and ever, and it says also in in 20, it says that death and Hades were thrown into the lake of the fire, for the lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name is not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death. It is totally being separated from God. Right, so, so then, just to sum up the two points, if those that rebel with Satan suffer as he suffered, that would be forever and ever. And death is described here as something ongoing. All right, very important questions, Matthew. Uh, to you, Mr. Fudge, your response. Sir, uh, first of all, uh, here, the caller is correct. Then says that it speaks of Satan, and then it otherwise speaks of in other places of the of the lost people. And you also have death and Hades thrown in the lake of fire. When we have death and Hades thrown in the lake of fire, I think everybody agrees that means the total end of the, the annihilation of death and Hades. They will never exist anymore. Every time human beings are mentioned in connection with the lake of fire in Revelation, it always adds this phrase that the caller mentioned, that is, that it's the second death. It's as if John wants to be careful that we don't misunderstand that, that the lake of fire means the second death. And the second death is is following the first death, which was the death that we experience in this life. He's he's saying for those who who are not saved, they, they will not have eternal life, but they will die, perish, and be destroyed. Uh, I, I just think that's such an important point to make. I appreciate your opening comment just now as well, uh, Brother Michael, when you said we want to use biblical language. And I'll just say that when you read the quote while ago from Jonathan Edwards, there's nowhere in Scripture that uses that kind of language. That's the way to talk about eternal torment. If the Scriptures wanted to talk about that, they could have said something like you read from Jonathan Edwards. But instead they say, die perish and destroy over and over and over and over again. And it just seems so strange to me that we should be expected and required every time we read a verse like that, even John 3.16, to say immediately, but don't think this really means what it sounds like because it's talking about just the opposite. All right, and and, Matthew, I'm sure that you'd like to be able to go back and forth with Mr. Fudge. As you can hear, we're having... A lot of problems with our phone system today, for which we apologize. And to have two callers going back and forth, as we commonly do when we have a guest, it's just not working. So thank you, though, for raising those. I, I want to pursue one question, though, and this is also a question for Brian. Uh, Brian in Boston wants to ask this as well. What are you saying is 
the final fate of Satan because Revelation, I understand it's a symbolic apocalyptic book, but it does use the language of him being tormented day and night forever and ever. What does that mean if not what it says? Well, let me say this. That my books and my convictions are about people in hell, and I'm not really uh, trying to be final about Satan. And yet I would say this, that some of the finest New Testament scholars who are believers, such as Richard Balcom, for example, say that that language, even the language that sounds like everlasting torment in that verse, they say that that really in apocalyptic usage was intended to describe annihilation. Now, that's something I don't know for sure, so I don't say that. But uh, Yeah, and obvi- obviously it could be debated, and, and of course you have descriptions that are kind of Dante Inferno-like or less so Jonathan Edwards-like in some of the apocalyptic Jewish literature of the day. But thank you for the call, Matthew. So you are saying then there's a possibility in your mind that Satan will be tormented forever and ever. I think he will not. I think he will be annihilated as well. But if that's right, if I'm mistaken on that, it doesn't change anything that I'm urging about human beings. You mentioned right. T.S. Lewis a while ago. If I may read one sentence from him. Please, says, Hell please. was not made for men. It is in no sense parallel to heaven. It is the darkness outside, the outer rim, where being fades away into non-entity. But, but doesn't it say, though, that, that we are cast into the same place that has been prepared for the devil and his angels? Yes, it does, but I don't think that necessarily means the same fate after people, reside, after people go there. Right, but you can understand how someone could easily come to that conclusion. Absolutely, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying, uh, Brother Michael, I'm not saying that, that uh, my view is so clear that nobody could possibly think otherwise. I'm, I'm saying, after 32 years of studying this, with, after my first book was published, and debating it and discussing it and praying over it, uh, this, this has come to be more and more firm in my mind that this is what Scripture teaches. But I'm certainly not saying that anybody who thinks otherwise, especially in the very beginning, is, uh, is, is less intelligent or less pious or any such thing. I understand. All right. Thank, and again, friends, uh, my apologies for the quality of our phone connections. We're doing everything we can to fix that. But my apologies. Hopefully you're not missing any of the content in the midst of it. Uh, let's go to Chad in Simi Valley, California. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, thank you, Dr. Brown, and also thank you, Mr. Fudge. Uh, I just had a real quick question um, from Matthew 25, starting at verse 31. We have Jesus, the Son of Man, coming in his glory with his angels, and he's coming, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He goes into talking about the righteous man, who are those who fed him when he was thirsty, speaking of the body, and um, were there for him, and visited when he was sick and in prison, and then those who don't. And then verse 46, it ends it with, These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, I know the same Greek word, Ionion, is used there. And what I'm wondering is, if you look at that verse, it seems like either you have, don't you have an eternal life that ends, or an eternal punishment that doesn't end. Um, because it's eternal punishment and eternal life, using the same exact word, comparing the two. So how do you get around it not being... You'd have to say there's no eternal life as well, I mean, as, as I'm reading it. I mean, I'd love to have some clarity there. Sure, and of course, Matthew twenty five forty six being one of the key verses that comes up. So, uh, I, of course, I'm aware of Mr. Fudge's responses to these, but back to you, Edward. Yes, thank you. I uh, appreciate the question, sir. There are at least two uh, answers that may be given to that question. First of all, you're right that the word Ionios is used of both, and I believe we need to be sure we uh, give it that meaning in both places. But in, in the first place, the word Ionios in the New Testament frequently means something pertaining to the age to come rather than to the present age, and it does not always have the idea of everlasting. But, so we read of things that are everlasting, but uh, but have the emphasis on the age to come, for example, eternal salvation, eternal redemption, and so on. These, that doesn't mean that the process of redeeming goes on forever. It means that it, it's something that belongs to the age to come. But in the second place, even giving it a, a quantitative meaning, if you please, that says goes on forever, that doesn't mean that the process goes forever. 
it may mean the result is everlasting, as in eternal redemption, eternal judging, eternal judgment rather, and eternal redemption. Those don't last forever in the, in the doing of them, but once done, the, the outcome is everlasting. Uh, the, 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 you raised the question a moment ago, uh, Dr. Brown, about uh, would this reduce our zeal for evangelism? I didn't have a chance to respond to that. I really would like to do that. All right, t- tell you what, then. We, we've got a break. When we come back, we'll go straight to that question. If you believe in ultimate annihilation, doesn't that lessen the burden for evangelism? So, Chad, in short, the argument would be there's a difference between eternal punishment, meaning a punishment that lasts forever, and eternal punishing. That would be Mr. Fudge's answer. Thank you. It's an important verse we need to consider. The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to this important broadcast with Edward Fudge, author of The Fire That Consumes and other books that deal with the final fate of the lost. And the question of uh, future punishment and evangelism if you really believe that people will suffer forever, how will that affect your burden for the lost, your willingness to sacrifice for the lost? If you believe that the punishment will come to an end and that they'll be destroyed, and that's the ultimate punishment, they'll be destroyed, they won't receive eternal life, they will be separated from God forever, but there will be no ongoing conscious suffering, would that lessen your burden? And then a particular question that has been raised by those living in Buddhist countries, Asian Christians, who say that the idea of a final annihilation is not really bad for Buddhists. They kind of look forward to a a non-existence. Even if it's dreadful in the giving out, it's not all that bad. But the idea of eternal suffering is. So, uh, Edward, you wanted to respond to the general question about burden and evangelism. And obviously, we're not going to tell an untruth to get people to evangelize more. So I'm 100% harmony with you. The question is, what does God's Word say? And I've, I'm, I'm one over the years, and I have been one over the years, who's been free to question certain church traditions and church beliefs, not thinking that everything that every church or group says is therefore infallible, or that the creeds through the centuries are all infallible. So I've got no problem reexamining things based on Scripture. But the twofold question, one, what about this, something that takes away the urgency that has fueled missionaries for many years, and then the particular Buddhist objection? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, sir. I think you would agree with me for sure in the first place that we cannot decide doctrine based on our own emotional opinion or reaction Mm -hmm. to something. And I just want to be clear here that I think it would be wrong to say that uh, we should go out and say to people, I wonder what, or think to ourselves, I wonder how I preach hell in the way that attracts the most people and then gets the most favorable response. That would be wrong to do that because the question has to be, what does the Bible tell me to say on the subject? On the other hand, we, we sometimes forget that it's just as wrong to go out and say with the assumption that I must think, what is the most horrible possible scenario that could possibly be painted of hell. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes people say my view is wrong because they don't consider it as bad as the other view. Well, that, that's beside the point. Whether it's more heinous or less heinous is not the basis of measuring it by what the scriptures say. Uh, now, your, your, your wonderful question about how does this affect the zeal for evangelism. I'm going to end by five, five quick thoughts on that. And the last one is, script, is the scriptural point. In the first place, I would say that uh, it's a subjective thing whether annihilation is worse than eternal conscious torment or better. People have had different opinions. This is the opinion of one man, Dr. Terrence Tyson, who is a Reformed scholar, uh, retired recently from teaching at Seminary Canada, evangelical man. He says annihilation is equally as terrible as unending torment. I am particularly unable to grasp the concern of some people that annihilationism would diminish our evangelistic zeal. The awfulness of being forever cut off 
from fellowship with God is so terrible that it's hard for me to fathom how either annihilationism or traditionalism would affect one's passion for evangelism. And so there are people who have different views, but I think he's got a good point here. That the, the main point is being cut off from God and losing that forever, and that's equally bad either, either way. The second point, uh, if we can ask the question, who is the man over the last 50 years in evangelical Christianity who has been best known and most associated with world evangelism? The Lausanne Conference, the Langham Foundation, it certainly must be John Stott. He held to annihilationism for 50 years and he was probably the evangelical best known for leadership in world missions. It did not affect his zeal whatsoever. And then they, the second thing, unending torment has not converted the world. For 1,600 years since Augustine, that's been the predominant message of the church. If that were such a cure-all message, we would think everybody would have been converted by now. But most people don't even believe it when they hear it. In fact, the opposite is true. The traditional view has created atheists, in every century since it's been being taught, from Bertrand Russell up to a number of years ago with Anthony Flew more recently, atheists come out of that view. That's not a basis for changing our doctrine, but if what I'm saying is true, it certainly is a good side effect. And then finally, out of five reasons, I would say that uh, the scriptural reason is the most important of all, and that is this. Um, Al Mohler says in the book, uh, hell, hell Under Fire, following the example of Jesus, the early Christian evangelists and preachers called sinners to faith in Christ and warned of the sure reality of hell and the eternal punishment of the unrepentant. We would expect that if that were the case, if that were a major motive in apostolic preaching, surely we would see it in the book of Acts. The book of Acts contains, by my count, 17 evangelistic encounters. Only four times does, does anything about the judgment even appear in the most generic way? Only four times. Cornelius is told in Acts 10, Jesus will be the judge. Paul tells the people of Athens in Acts 17, Jesus will be a judge. He reasons with Felix in Acts 24 of judgment to come. Three of these times just say there will be a judgment. They don't say anything about what happens after that. The only time in the whole book of Acts one time that he mentions anything about what will happen after final judgment is found in Acts 3, where Peter says it will come to pass that whoever does not listen to the voice of the prophet will be totally destroyed or utterly cut off from among the people. The Greek word there is ex holothruo. This is the only time it's found in the New Testament. I visited with the Greek scholar Spiro Zodiates when I was writing The Fire That Consumes and asked him about this passage. He said that if that passage were all he had, it would certainly teach your view. Now, the fact is that in the Septuagint, that same word is used regularly to describe the effect of the flood and to describe capital punishment. Yeah, and, and I, I just need to, I just need to, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off. Um, somehow, uh, well, tell you what, we are, we are out of time with a break here. We've got our listeners really wanting to weigh in. And I, d- I did want to give you a substantial amount of time to reply to that. I want to talk about nature of destruction when we come back, but I-, I will go straight to the phones when we do. Switching subjects from the fire of hell to the question of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Have you downloaded your copy yet of Authentic Fire? A response to John MacArthur's Strange Fire. I mentioned the first hour. I'm I'm blown away by the responses we're getting. You're going to see reviews being posted on Amazon in days to come. I'm amazed at how people are finding this book, and they recognize my gracious tone towards Pastor MacArthur throughout. It's not a book that tears down, but that builds up. You owe it to yourself to read it on either side of the debate. You can download it right now at Amazon.com, Authentic Fire, Michael Brown, or to get a print copy, 420 pages Uh, I don't expect it to arrive free before Christmas, but soon after, your year-end tax-deductible gift of any size. We just ask you to be as generous as you can, and we'll send you the book as our thank you. 1-800-278-9978. 1-800-278-9978. It's The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. 
your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions of millions of ages, in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty merciless vengeance. And when you have so done, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains, so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Well, those are the words of Jonathan Edwards in his famous message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. My guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, has pointed out that that specific language is not found in Scripture but let's come at this from another angle as we talk about hell and future punishment, 866-34-TRUTH. Let's consider this. If Mr. Fudge is correct that there is punishment for the sinner rec- requisite with their sin, we all agree that'll be the case, and then the final judgment is eternal destruction, what if the sinner continues to sin during that time of being judged, wouldn't that then create an endless cycle? That's a question many have raised. We'll go to the phones and then get Mr. Fudge's response. Sheila in Englewood, New Jersey, thank you so much for holding, and welcome to the line of fire. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Brown. This um, second, Mr. Fudge, is um, after listening to him, he is helping to fulfill Second Thessalonians. Are you hearing me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. Fudge is helping to fulfill Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, with and all my, all my scripture coming from the King James Version. And Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, says that God will send strong delusion for those that rejected Christ. Mr. Fudge is helping to fulfill that. And thank you for taking my call. All right. Uh, That's a very serious charge. Uh, Edward, I'm sure you've wrestled with these things. You sound like a a sensitive soul. The charge that there is strong delusion, the charge that you are ultimately deceiving people and teaching what you teach, obviously you've wrestled with these things. I believe that you're convinced, based on your study of Scripture, it's not a popular position to espouse in, in many ways. I'm sure you've suffered a certain degree of rejection for this in some circles and celebration in others. What to this charge, though, that you're deluding people, and when the Word of God speaks of eternal punishment or torment day and night forever and ever, you're lessening that, and there is, in that sense, blood on your hands. Well, that would be a terrible thing to do, for sure. I would just encourage this listener and anyone else to uh, to pick up my book, Hell, A Final Word, and uh, read the scriptures throughout that book. He goes through the whole Bible and essentially summarizes in a very popular form the uh, content of my scholarly book, The Fire That Consumes. Uh, So that's an important charge. We should be very sure we're not doing what she says, and I trust that I'm not because my argument is totally based on Scripture, the Word of God. Got it. And again, friends, when Mr. Fudge takes this position He's willing to take the challenges and questions that come with it. Jay in Manhattan, thanks for holding. Welcome to the line of fire. Welcome. Uh, Merry Christmas, Michael, and Merry Christmas to you, uh, Mr. Fudge. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fudge, you know, like when I hear you, you remind me of um, people like David C. Pack, Richard Aim, uh, Richard Flurry, and Herbert W. Armstrong. Have you ever had any association with um, the Worldwide Church of God? And are you familiar with people like uh, Doug Batchelor and Pastor um, Joe Cruz? All right. Tell you what, Jay, thank you for the question. Edward, so you can answer it in, less, uh, in more than five seconds. We'll come back to any association with the Worldwide Church of God. And although, Jay, you didn't ask this overtly, I mean, it's fair to ask. Jehovah's Witnesses, Worldwide Church of God, other fringe groups or cults, they've taught this. Why do the cults teach it if it's orthodox theology? Fire. 
It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, that, that is another thing that concerned me over the years. Why is it that Jehovah's Witnesses got this supposedly right in the midst of their other serious error? Why is it that other cults or fringe groups have held to this? If this is actually orthodox scriptural theology, 866-34-TRUTH, we're talking about the nature of hell. My guest, Mr. Edward Fudge, his popular book on the subject, Hell, A Final Word. And the two questions then for you, Edward. First, have you had any association with Worldwide Church of God? Second, why is it that cults and fringe groups have held to this uh, in their departure from, quote, Orthodox Christianity, if in fact they're the Orthodox ones on this? Well, first of all, I have not had any uh, connection with the Worldwide Church of God or Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, do not teach what I'm saying. They believe that the grave is hell and the wicked are never raised. I believe the wicked are raised. They face God in judgment. They're cast into hell. They suffer according to perfect divine justice, and they suffer the final penalty of everlasting destruction, which Paul speaks of. Just because uh, some group or person does teach something doesn't make it wrong. Uh, they, they are right about some things, and I think the reason some of the people who are considered fringe groups perhaps are right about this and, and, and so on is because they realized in their Bible study this was a weakness in so-called orthodox theology, and they have taught what the Bible said, and others rejected it, which they should not have done. On the other hand, you have people like F.F. F. Bruce, John Stott, Preston Sprinkle, who wrote the book of, uh, in response to Rob Bell with Francis Chan, and has since that time come to be identified as a, the same view that I'm holding. These are solid men conservative, uh, Bible-believing scholars. Nobody has any objection to them, and they had the courage to say against the great flood of opposition at their stake of their own reputation, we do not believe the traditional view anymore. We believe the Bible teaches this other view. All right, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that answer, Jay. Thank you for the question. And uh, again, I, I hope you understand, Edward, as we're talking, that I'm doing several things. I'm raising honest scriptural questions I have. I'm raising questions I know that others have. And I'm facilitating our listeners asking you questions. And I appreciate you be will- your willingness to take on all of the questions in a gracious spirit you as can well. Say anything, say anything you like, ask anything you like. I'm right beside you. I understand what's going on. Amen. All right. I, I do appreciate that. I, I, I want to say something, and then I want to get to a few more calls. Let me just say this, though. As someone who holds to or held to over years the idea of eternal punishing, let, let's say your average Christian out there. Now, I, I preach for years. We don't actually believe it. No, we, we say it, but we don't believe it based on the way we live. If we really believed it, we'd all be going for the lost day and night. So, so I've challenged that. If we, if we teach this, how come we're living the way we're living if we actually believe these things to be true? But your average person out there, I know we had a call from, from an annihilationist in the first hour, Chris, one of the gentlemen who helped uh, encourage us to have this interview with Mr. Fudge. But I, I'm thinking of someone who has always believed that there is eternal conscious torment for the lost or eternal punishing or hell lasts forever. The punishment of hell on the sinner consciously lasts forever. To come to this doctrine and that there's a final end, I I personally believe for many it would take away the burden for the lost. It it would take away the, the, okay, they're lost, it's terrible, but still it's going to end at a certain point. Now that that may not be right or fair in terms of a way of reasoning. I'm just saying I, I still want to see, hear, witness the passionate burden for the lost, a broken heart to win a lost and dying world, a sense of the horrible nature of the judgment to come, which should shake us to the core of our beings. I, I need to hear that. I'm not saying I'm not hearing it from Edward Fudge. I'm not denying Chris what he said. I, I, I just something I'm looking at. 
to be perfectly honest. All right, uh, to the phones, Alan in Baltimore, Maryland, thanks for calling the line of fire. Yes, uh, I would like to say up front that I, I do disagree, and uh, I, he's, he's annihilated my argument. He's the first one I've ever heard that said, well, he believes that there's... Oh, I'm sorry, I, let me address you um, um, first, uh, directly. Uh, I don't want to be disrespectful. If you believe that there will be different limits of time for different punishments depending on which the sin is. And my argument was that it doesn't make sense for God to just annihilate everyone because there are different degrees for different levels of punishment, but you've annihilated that argument. But I say that someone has to remain in hell for this reason forever. Jesus, did, when he died, his blood not only uh, forgave our sins, it not only atoned for it, but the Scripture says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When we receive our glorified bodies, our sin nature will be gone. We will not have the very presence of sin with us. When the unrighteous die, their sin nature remains, and it is permanent. So if someone suffers for a billion years or 10 trillion years, when they come out and they say, all right, Lord, I've suffered long enough, I I think that's long enough, and God might say, well, yeah, you have suffered long enough for your sins. The problem is your sin nature is still in you. You're still a sinful being. You have not been changed, and there will be no place in God's universe for sin. Your sin must continually be paid for, because when you suffer for it, you'll never be able to pay the price that will take your sin away. That's the problem. Your sin remains. And All right. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry to jump in, Alan. Let, let me just switch over to, to, uh, to Edward Fudge for his response. Uh, some have said that you do not have a sufficient understanding of the nature of human sin. Or as a friend tweeted me earlier, there's a lack of understanding of biblical anthropology. If you think that there can be a certain degree of punishment for sin, then it's over. And what of the fact that we can assume, based on what we see in Scripture, that as someone is judged, that they will not be repentant, but will continue to sin in the midst of judgment. So there's the nature, the, the need for ongoing punishment. Your response to that? Yes, sir. Let me just mention on the side and we did not yet have a chance to respond to your question about Isaiah sixty six twenty four, The I worm, was, right, and, and Mark 9. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll come to that. Answer this first, and then we'll come back yeah, to the worm right. that doesn't die. I, 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 think that, I think that your question has to do with the whole thing that, that Anselm developed about, uh, about the idea of infinite person and infinite sin requiring infinite punishment. Is that, is that what he's talking about? Yeah, or just just the the sinfulness of human nature is not just the sins I commit, which are paid for, right okay. by certain degrees of punishment, but sinfulness itself cannot be paid for except well, through the blood of any, Jesus. I don't know any scripture that says people are punished because of their nature as a separate thing from their be, from their behavior. Oh, it's committing sins that is punished, and then so far as I know, the only sins that scripture says people are punished for in hell are those that were committed during this life on earth. There are a lot of scholars who hold the traditional view who argue that uh, the wicked will go on sinning and that requires more punishment. I would say that they're opening the door to universalism because if what people do in hell can change the future or destiny of their situation in hell, uh, one should be tempted to think that they could possibly repent somewhere and that could lead to, uh, to their, their salvation. Um, I, I do agree with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the answer to that would be that grace is not extended, therefore repentance is impossible. But, uh, but we, we, we believe that is a separate point, uh, right. but it doesn't necessarily follow from the logic of the thing, I think. The, the, the other thing is, uh, well, I, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, so on the, on the, on the, yes, the, the thing about infinite person and, and that human beings cannot pay the penalty because we're not... Uh, we're only mortal and we're sinners. That started with Anselm, who based it on feudal justice, under which a person who was a higher-ranking individual was not punished as severely as the lower-ranking culprit who did the same crime. 
and so forth. That was contrary to God's teaching about justice in the Old Testament, where it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, that's never said to be the way God operates. It was feudal justice. And in fact, in the Reformed uh, churches, after the Reformation, there was a man who came along and examined all that. It was Reformed and said, no, this was wrong reasoning, and it's not even logical. It certainly is not scriptural, and that's the main point to me. Can we go to Isaiah 66? I tell you what, we'll, we'll go to Isaiah 66. As soon as we come back, we'll try to get to a couple more phone calls. Alan, thank you for the call. Again, we're putting the issues on the table. We're not having a full-fledged debate, we're trying to get to as many calls as possible. This is a discussion that will and must continue. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to The Line of Fire. Two hours flying by, as expected, talking about a, a, a tremendously important subject, the nature of future punishment. Does the fire consume the sinner? Does the sinner suffer in conscious torment forever. Weighty, weighty subjects. My guest, Edward Fudge, his scholarly book on the subject, The Fire That Consumes, his popular book, Hell, A Final Word. Uh, Edward, I want to try to get to a couple more calls before we're done and raise a couple last points, but our time is really short. So if you could just in short explain the image of the, the worm doesn't die, the fire doesn't go out, the worm doesn't die. Why use this image if there is a punishment that comes to an end. Yes, so the, the language comes from Isaiah 66, 24, which is the last verse in Isaiah, and he pictures the saved who are living in the New Jerusalem coming outside the city, and he says they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and the word means maggots, and their fire will not be quenched or put out and they will be in abhorrence or disgust to all mankind. It's a picture of the final end of sinners, pictured as a garbage dump outside a city where there are crawling maggots, smoldering fires, and the corpses are put there of those who, in verse 16, he said, the Lord has slain, uh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many, and they, their worm does not die, the maggots do not stop the gnawing, the fire is not quenched, it keeps burning, until everything is totally gone. It's a disgusting picture. It's a picture not of torment, but of, of, of the destruction. It's a picture of worms and fire not inside people, as Judith in the Apocrypha later rewrites Isaiah to say, to say but of a, a destructive agent on the outside. It's disgust, not pity. And then the picture is one that is generally totally ignored uh, when, when people argue for the traditional point of view. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it really is the truth. All right. I appreciate you giving that interpretation of the passage. Let's go to uh, Ian in... All right. Lost Ian. Let's go to Dennis in Arlington, Texas. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Thank you very much for taking my call, Michael. I appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Fudge, uh, I'm, I'm listening to you on the radio, and I just want to ask you if you are aware that God is perfect and he doesn't make mistakes. And the reason I ask you that is because I believe God wrote or had inspired everything that he meant. He, he didn't make a mistake when he said eternal damnation and eternal fire is exactly what he meant. And also, last question, I'll get out there and listen. Did you know in the book of Revelations, God says that anybody who adds or subtracts from this book, basically there's a special place for them. And thank you for your time. Thank you for taking my call, Michael. All right. So, so Edward, you have all the language about destruction, cut off, death, etc. God can destroy body and soul in hell. On the other hand, you have so many things speaking of eternal, eternal destruction, eternal damnation, eternal punishment, and then language in the book of Revelation of people being punished, tormented day and night, forever and ever, um, 
isn't that a little bit misleading of the Lord to put those things there if he meant something that comes to a final end? I think not. I think if we read carefully, we can understand that eternal, as I mentioned before, means of the age to come in the first place. In the second place, I'm describing a punishment that is eternal, the destruction is eternal punishment. Uh, and, and I would say, and I frequently say when I teach on this subject in churches or schools or whatever, at the conclusion of my talk, I frequently say, if you forget everything else I've said, just remember two verses of Scripture that you knew before you came. One is Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The other is John three sixteen, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I suggest and I offer for the consideration of those who are listening that there's nothing that could be plainer or more obvious if we let words stand and have their face value meaning than to say the final choices are life and death as ordinary people commonly understand that language. And you, you, you would certainly agree, though, that life and death are defined in spiritual terms in Scripture, that someone can be dead while they live, and that all of us who are alive today, the majority of the human race is living in spiritual death. So th- those words are redefined within Scripture itself. But Edward, uh, I'm glad we've been able to have this conversation as much time as we've taken and taken calls from listeners. Uh, we've put the essential issues on the table. On another level, we've barely scratched the surface. So I want to encourage everyone, just as you do, to study the issues carefully to fight against any tendency to go in either direction in terms of what to believe. On the one hand, wanting to rationalize hell away. On the other hand, wanting to hold to a position because it's more popular with the church. Ultimately, we're going to have to stand before God, you and I, and give account for our beliefs. Well, and I, I mentioned a couple of resources. Yeah, please. Uh, there's a very excellent resource a website called RethinkingHell.com, RethinkingHell.com, that has about 40-something interviews of people who hold all different kinds of views and lots of good material. Also, there's a movie called Hell and Mr. Fudge, which has a website, HellandMrFudge.com, and there's a DVD available now on that. Uh, I invite anyone to look at those besides the books. That have been mentioned already, The Fire That Consumes, and the popular book, Hell, The Final Word. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today, uh, Brother Brown, and I thank you for your kindness and courtesy. And, and thank you for your graciousness, Edward, and we agree as believers that these are eternally important issues, that we recognize one another as believers in this. And I'm very happy to quote Scripture, as I said, and let Scripture speak for itself. Thank you for, for being my guest and being such a gentleman. I appreciate it. All right, you heard about all of those resources. Look at them. Study them. Uh, we will give you a list of some books presenting, quote, the traditional view of hell as well so that you can evaluate them. Uh, we'll, we'll post them in the next couple of days also. And let's work together to win a lost and dying world to the eternal truth of the gospel. Please take a minute. It only take you a minute. It'll take a few seconds and it won't cost you much at all online. Download your copy of Authentic Fire Response to John MacArthur's Strange Fire. Uh, it has very quickly taken off online and people are getting the book, unable to put it down, reading several hundred pages, and they're not coming away with hostility towards John MacArthur's Strange Fire Camp. They're coming away with greater love, but a greater appreciation for the truth of Scripture and the power of the Spirit. So download your book now. If you don't have a Kindle e-reader, you can download the free app at Amazon.com. Just look for Authentic Fire. To get a print copy only through our ministry, they're available. We're eagerly waiting for the shipment to arrive. Call 1-800-278-9978. We're simply asking for a generous year-end tax-deductible gift, and we'll send you the book, one 800 Two seven eight nine nine seven eight. My bottom line today, with the churches taught or not, is not the biggest issue. The question is, what does the Word of God say about the subject of hell? 